I'm Cecilia Lay, and this is Fifth and Mission. Governor Newsom's pen got busy over the past weekend. He had a Sunday night deadline to sign or veto all of the bills pending from this legislative session. Newsom finishes work Saturday, and now we've got some new laws in California, which mostly take effect January 1st. The governor signed just under 800 new laws and vetoed over 60 during the 2021 legislative calendar. Here to talk us through the governor's final weekend of bill action, as well as some highlights from the state's entire legislative session, is Chronicle State Capitol reporter Dustin Gardner. Dustin, thanks so much for being here. Let's dive into it. And I want to start with one that got quite a bit of attention, at least on my social media feeds. California is the first state to outlaw stealthing. What is it? Yeah, so stealthing is the act of removing a condom during sex without getting your partner's consent. And this act um, has gotten a lot of attention in recent years. Um, Some countries in Europe outlaw this or they consider it rape. Um, But in California, it wasn't specifically addressed in our code. Um, So under this bill, um, it it is considered a crime. It's outlawed and um, it's added added to the statute for sexual battery. And who was behind this bill? How How did it come about? Yeah, so the legislator behind this, um, her name is Christina Garcia. She's from down from like the Los Angeles area. And, you know, she worked with a lot of victims, advocates um, and groups that have been trying to raise attention around this issue. And during the debate, she really talked about just how incensed she was to find out that there's forums and blogs online where people actually discuss how how to stealth and they give advice on how to remove a condom without your partner knowing. Um, so really, it's been a big concern for, for sexual health advocates and groups, you know, that, that raise awareness around those issues. Mm-hmm. And another new law that seems to be getting attention is the ban on gas-powered leaf blowers, lawnmowers, and other small gas engines. Seems timely, especially now that I'm seeing leaves all over the sidewalks. (laughs) But it's not a total ban. So how is this going to work? Yes, definitely a very timely issue. We've got leaves all (laughs) over the place in Sacramento right now. Um, But yeah, so this is not an immediate ban. Um, At the earliest, this would take effect in 2024. um, But state air quality regulators will have the option to potentially delay that if they say if they think there's some sort of issue with the implementation. So again, this isn't going to be happening tomorrow. um, But this does set a timeline where the state has to eventually make this happen. Um, And and like you said, this this is not just leaf blowers. This includes includes all sorts of garden equipment. Um, and technically, it's defined as any sort of small off-road engine. So this would include lawnmowers, weed whackers, all sorts of noisy things that people have in their yards. I mean, people have been complaining about things like leaf blowers for a really long time because of the noise, myself included, especially during the work from home situation. But was this like climate change driven or as a way to get this done, people worried about emissions and such? Yeah, you know, that's funny. Ever since I reported the story over the weekend on Twitter, a lot of people that have responded have said that. They said, oh my I, oh my gosh, I'm so happy that, you know, that those loud leaf blowers are going to go away. They've talked about the noise. Um, but actually, this bill really was about climate and air pollution. Um, and the sponsor of the bill, Mark Berman, a legislator from um, the Silicon Valley area, he emphasized this idea that these small, small machines while they, they while they look small, they do emit large levels of pollution, especially you know very dangerous types of toxins that are in some of um, you know some of these engines. Um, and so, yeah, this was about climate and this was about air quality. And then another one, one that I imagine conservatives and right wing media will be all over. Uh, there is now a mandate that large retail stores have a gender neutral area or display for selling toys and other items for kids. Can you tell us more about that one? Yeah. So, you know, in in retail stores for, you know, forever, there have been these blue sections for boys and the pink section for girls. Um, Some large retailers have been getting away from that. um, And now the state is nudging those that aren't already going in that direction. And the the law basically requires retailers to have, they can keep the the boys and the girls sections, but they also need to have this, this third section that is gender neutral. And this would apply to children's toys, 
um, other children's products like, you know, toothbrushes or bath, bath care items. It doesn't apply to children's clothing. And that was kind of a sticking point in the debate, um, whether there needed to be truly a gender or gender neutral uh, section for clothing. Um, but, you know, there has been a lot of sort of uproar about this in conservative circles. I think this is something that like Fox News and others have grabbed on to. Um, but interestingly, this didn't really prompt a ton of debate um, in the legislature, mm. uh, you know, in our supermajority Democratic legislature. I think a lot of lawmakers didn't really bat, bat an eye at this. Um, and, you know, the sponsor, Evan Lowe, who's from a legislator from Silicon Valley, he said a lot of retailers are already going this direction. And he said that the part of the reason is that parents are, don't, don't, aren't adhering to kind of those traditional norms in a lot of cases anymore about what is a, a girl's or a boy's toy. A lot of parents want, you know, a boy to be comfortable, you know, practicing ballet and they want a girl to be comfortable, you know, may, maybe um, wanting to drive a truck or play with trucks. Um, so I, I just think legislators in a lot of cases felt like this acknowledges sort of a cultural norm that has become more established. So some big bills signed by Newsom. Was there anything else from this past weekend that's worth mentioning? You know, some of the ones you just discussed seem to lean progressive, uh, you know, a lot of issues that are going to be top of mind for a lot of communities. What else is worth mentioning? Another interesting bill that was sponsored by a legislator from the Bay Area, um, State Senator Scott Weiner from San Francisco, he carried a bill that requires health care um, healthcare plans and insurers to ensure that um, people that seek mental health care, that they, they have timely follow-up care. There was a big issue during the pandemic with a lot of people who were seeking uh, mental health care or addiction care that they were having to wait weeks and months with some of the state's big insurance plans to get follow-up appointments. And this requires them to provide timely care. So I think that's a big one for a lot of people that have been struggling during the pandemic. So those are the laws that Newsom passed. How about ones that he chose to veto? I understand one of them was a bill that would have decriminalized jaywalking. Yeah. So Phil Ting, one of our legislators, he carried a bill that would have pre- it would have prevented um, the state from fining people for jaywalking or arresting people for jaywalking. Um, And this would apply in situations where no car is present in the street. So, you know, someone crosses the street, there's no traffic, the the police can't cite them. And Phil Ting's big concern was that he feels like that the jaywalking laws have been a pretext for police to harass people of color. And he cited some studies that showed that people of color are disproportionately cited for jaywalking. Um, And the governor, um, on the other hand, argued that there is a rising um, number of ped- pedestrian fatalities in the state, and he said that this is just not the right the right time to be encouraging people to cross the street in areas where there's not a crosswalk when more people are dying in the streets. Um, and Phil Ting really disagreed with that. He said he's not done pushing this. So I think this one will definitely come back. Um, so that that was another big veto. I think we can expect that bill to come back next year in some form. Um, and then another one was dealing with bicycle stops at uh, stop signs. Um, mm-hmm. there, there was a bill that would have allowed uh, cyclists to make so-called Idaho stops where they they basically are just yielding at a stop sign. They're, you know, decelerating and, and looking to see if there's no other traffic. They can continue through the intersection without stopping. That's a big priority for cyclists who don't want to continually be stopping around the city um, every time there, there's a stop sign. Um, and Newsom vetoed that, basically, again, arguing that it's a matter of safety and that he's concerned um, that, that not having but giving bicyclists more free reign to 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 plow through stop signs that 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 would somehow lead to more accidents. Cyclists, you know, argue the opposite. They say that 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 the data shows that if if they're spending less time in intersections, there's less likelihood that they'll actually end up being hit by vehicles. More with Dustin Gardner after a quick break. We'll hear about some other significant bills that Newsom has signed, including how California is going against the grain. While other states are banning critical race theory, high schoolers here will now be required to take an ethnic studies course. Also, a quick reminder, we'd love to understand what you want from Fifth Emission. Visit sfchronicle.com slash survey and tell us what you think. You'll be entered to win one of three $100 gift cards. It's a quick survey, I promise. sfchronicle.com slash survey. 
Dustin, let's chat about some other significant bills of the 2021 legislative session. Newsom has signed nearly 800 in total. Which ones have stood out to you? Yeah, so I'll talk about um, four big areas. Um, One of them is uh, elections and mail-in ballots. Um, Lawmakers approved a bill that will will continue basically all of the pandemic era uh, election changes that we saw. So this the, the main one is everyone receiving a mail-in ballot. And mm-hmm. that had been something that was just a, a pandemic precaution and that got extended through this year with the recall election. Um, and now this is permanent in California. This is going to be something for all future elections. So that's that's a really big one. Um, another one is ethnic studies. Um, the movement for ethnic studies started um, on Bay Area college campuses um, decades ago, about 50 years ago um, at, UC Ber- at UC Berkeley. Um and in the city as well. And, um, and now this is going, there's going to be a statewide requirement that all high school students take an ethnic studies course before they graduate. Um, this law would take effect in the 2029, 2030 school year. And so students are going to be required to learn about the contributions, but also the historic exploitation, um, and abuse of people of color throughout American history. Um, the course will focus on four key groups. So this is African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinos, and, um, and Native Americans. Um, and there, there was a lot of controversy about this bill, and, and the controversy stemmed over the state's model curriculum. This is basically a guidebook that says how the course will be structured. That that guidebook wasn't part of the bill, but the opponents of, of the curriculum tried to derail the bill because they weren't happy with the final curriculum. But th- there were some changes made by the State Department of Education earlier this year that removed some of the areas of the curriculum that were most controversial. And so the version that, that um, ended up going through um, by the time the legislature voted on, on the graduation requirement, there, there wasn't a whole lot of controversy left. I mean, at a time when the nation has been, uh, you know, debating critical race theory, this seems like the state's taking a stance on how important, you know, uh, lessons and and teaching students about race is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And yeah, I mean, legislators were really, they they felt really strongly about this. And this has been an issue that some of them who, who who sponsored this bill, they've been pushing for this for decades, really. Mm -hmm. Some of them were ethnic studies professors that were part of the movement that, you know, that started all those decades ago. And there there was discussion of critical race theory. Some Republicans in the legislature brought that up and they, you know, they really said they felt like this was too politically charged and inappropriate for, you know, for high school students to be focusing on on how racism is ingrained in American institutions and laws. Uh, On the other hand, Democrats and supporters of the bill said that, you know, that that students deserve to get an honest rendering of American history. And they said in particular for students of color that having that that history allows themselves to see them themselves in the textbooks, in the history, and that that improves their academic performance over time. Yeah. I mean, it feels like at least these two most recent bills you mentioned, you know, the ethnic studies one and the permanent mail-in election seem like to be really responding to key things that the whole country was talking about in 2020 and most recently. What else was passed uh, that may be a response to all these really uh, critical issues that were being talked about? Yeah, there's a couple other biggies that definitely come to mind. Um, With police accountability, that was, again, another big issue at the legislature. Some of the bigger bills did get watered down pretty substantially. um, But but one one major measure that got through um, creates a decertification process. So police officers that are are problem officers can be decertified by the state. Um, Many other states already have this process on the books. And California just didn't have a good process for the state to to lead in that just decertification action. What would be an example of something that a police officer could do that would qualify him for decertification? Yeah, so it's a pretty long list. Um, the bill defines it as serious misconduct, um, and that can include things like excessive force, committing sexual assault, um, displaying bias on the job, participating in a, in a law enforcement gang. So it's a pretty wide gamut of inappropriate behavior. Anything else from the legislative session that you think is important to point out? 
Yeah, uh, the other biggie, and this is you know the perennial biggie at the legislature every year, is housing density. Um, and, mm. and but this year something actually got done. A couple of big things got done. Um, th- there were a pair of bills that were, will allow for duplexes and lot splitting in residential neighborhoods, um, which is the, the legislature has really struggled to make progress on that for a lot of years. They've just you know faced a gauntlet of complaints from neighbors that don't want the, the character of their neighborhood to change. But this year, I, the need started to tip and you know the, the yimbies um i think they had a pretty big victory in that sense of getting the legislature to allow more density in in neighborhoods and i also want to talk about things that didn't pass you know legislators also made a stance by not acting on certain bills which big fights are you keeping an eye on that might be shelved until next year this session, you know, we did talk about a number of big things that happened, but in a lot of ways, this session was um, uneventful compared to a lot of past years. And that was because the recall election with the governor overshadowed a lot of things. There were a lot of issues where the legislature punted or didn't want to dive into the weeds as much as they would have. And one is definitely vaccine mandates. Um, Legislators were talking about several weeks before the end of the session, they wanted to get some sort of mandate on the books, um, something for employers to require their workers to be vaccinated, and then maybe something to mandate vaccines to enter public spaces um, like bars or restaurants or movie theaters or gyms. Um, The Biden administration already did act on vaccine mandates for employers, but that but that mandate only applies to large employers with 100 or more employees. Some legislators want the state to go further and expand the mandate to smaller employers with uh, 99 or fewer workers. Uh, and legislators also want to look at some sort of statewide mandate for those you know, bars, restaurants, public places. Um, that's one big piece of the vaccine fight. And then the other piece is the requirement for students in schools to get vaccinated. The governor just a few weeks ago um, announced that California would be the first state to, to make that requirement once the vaccine is approved for, for younger age groups. Um, and there's big one big loophole in that. And that loophole is that um, the state has a personal belief exemption and the governor's action does not remove that. Legislators want to go and remove that. Um, so there is no personal belief exemption. Under the current law, California does not allow the personal belief exemption to apply to vaccines um, that are required for students to get into school. So that's going to be a very big uh, divisive fight with those two vaccine issues. Um, So that's one I think will take up a lot of oxygen. You know, we saw just a couple of years ago, vaccine protests kind of overtook the Capitol. I I think we'll see potentially a repeat of that. Um, Can I ask a follow up to that? Does it seem like Newsom is at this moment just still leaving it up to local jurisdictions to make the call on things like that? Yeah. So if we're talking about the piece of like vaccine mandates to go into restaurants and gyms and all that, the governor has uh, the governor's administration has left that up to local governments so far. And we haven't seen him wade into that. But the governor does seem to be when it comes to schools, he, you know, he's been aggressive on that front. He has talked about vaccine mandates and required mandates for healthcare workers and state employees. So he's been a little less hesitant on the other fronts, but I think he's more hesitant when it comes to those certain types of businesses. And then any other big fights that we should keep an eye on that are shelved possibly until next year? Yeah, the other big area is the environment. Um, The -hmm. the legislature and all of this going on with the recall and these other issues we've talked about, the environment completely took a backseat and almost every major environmental bill got killed in the legislature this year. And environmentalists are not... Minus banning gas... Uh, gas-powered lawnmowers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that one did get through. Um, <laughs> and and not, to, not to poo-poo that issue, but it, th- some of the more overarching, larger environmental bills are the ones that died. Um, and yeah. this is going to be really top of mind for environmentalists now be- after the oil spill that we saw recently, you know, 130,000 gallons of oil dumping into the ocean off the coast of Orange County. That really mm-hmm. has ticked off environmentalists who were already upset they didn't get more attention in Sacramento this year. So they're going to be pushing to ban offshore oil drilling and then also ban or completely regulate more strictly um, on on land drilling of oil. Well, Dustin, thank you so much for your reporting and giving us a roundup of the latest action by Newsom. I appreciate it so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. 
Dustin Gardner is the Chronicle's state capital reporter. You can learn more about the latest law signed by Newsom on sfchronicle.com or on the Chronicle app. Don't forget our Fifth Emission listener survey. It's at sfchronicle.com slash survey. Thanks to King Kaufman for producing this episode and to you for listening. <laughs>